Excellent. Welcome to the Metasploit team demo meeting for November 17th, 2020. Uh, hope everybody's doing well. I had a front blow in down here last two nights ago or so, and my allergies are kicking. So if anybody else is suffering, I feel you. We've got some good stuff to cover this week and a bunch of demos with Spencer McIntyre from our Metasploit research team taking us through the framework bits. I appreciate that. Let's hop on in. Uh, we'll move on to the framework portion of the meeting, which I will hand the virtual mic over to Spencer McIntyre on the Dharma team. Spencer? Thanks, Pierce. Yeah. All right, so we have a slew of new modules. This is the first of two slides that I'm happy to report. Uh, so the first up was a uh, Microtik Winbox uh, arbitrary file read, and this was provided by community contributor Hoodie and Mosajal, which exploits CVE 2018 uh, 14847. Uh, the next up was a SQL I scanner by community contributor Hoodie, uh, MS Lavco, and Red Fox, uh, which exploits CVE 2020 I believe this was an interesting module because uh, we got to see the code from our Google Summer of Code project was utilized within the SQL injection module. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, so big thanks to those uh, community contributors. Uh, next up from our own uh, Will Vu and KPC, we have a exploit for the Salt Stack REST API uh, exploit, which we will be demoing here shortly. Um, this exploit uh, is an authentication bypass along with an API command if you have vulnerability that leverages those two CVEs there. So we'll be taking a look at that here in a moment. Um, and then we have a, another WordPress vulnerability provided by a community contributor, Alex Soja um, and Imran uh, Dwajuji, which exploits CVE 2020-25213. Uh, so some good uh, WordPress content in there. And a couple uh, and uh, two additional modules uh, from community contributor Justin Steven, who also identified this vulnerability. Huge props to Justin for finding the flaw within Metasploit itself. That was a vulnerability uh, within the APK template uh, generation. Um, so he had reported that to us a few weeks ago and we got that patched. And then uh, Justin waited to go ahead and uh, release the exploit module to go ahead and demonstrate the vulnerability. So you can exploit Metasploit from within Metasploit. Uh, so huge thank you to Justin Steven for that. And finally, our last uh, new module was an Apache Zookeeper information disclosure by community contributor Karn Ganeshan. So huge thank you to everyone for uh, those, uh, those new modules. Uh, next up, we also have a whole bunch of new enhancements and features. Uh, community contributor Hoodie has been quite busy. Um, his PR uh, 14252 updates the Avira password uh, gather to uh, store capture credentials. So you have an easier time dealing with Avira passwords and managing those on uh, your penetration testing assessments. Uh, Jeffrey Martin um, adds a guard to notify users of incorrect or missing encoders, uh, which is a fantastic uh, user uh, improvement. So people get uh, better uh, warning messages around encoders, is uh, much easier to use. Uh, community contributor Hoodie, again, enhanced the Metasploit loader to provide more accurate uh, messages when external modules fail to load. Um, so we're having a growing number of extra modules implemented in Python and a number of other languages. Um, and this uh, enhancement helps users identify reasons why those might be failing. So it makes it a lot more useful and gives them that valuable information. Uh, next up, community contributor Steve Pacino updates the Zabbix login uh, module to support uh, the latest versions of Zabbix. Now it works on versions three, four, and five, all the way up to the newest release. Um, our own uh, Alan David Foster added a check to ensure uh, the use of auto check are always prepended as opposed to include. I think that was a, uh, an oopsie made by someone on our team. So hopefully that won't uh, happen again and we'll have an easier time using the uh, wonderful auto check mix in, which uh, really makes the modules a lot easier to use by prepending a check method before we run exploits as applicable. Um, our own Dean Welch uh, removed the unused Netware console session type. So a nice code cleanup of some code that had not been used. 
um, and community contributor Hoodie added vulnerable version information to the um, Drupal View Users Enum uh, scanner module. And then finally, uh, our own Alan, or excuse me, Adam Galway uh, modified the MSBB uh, command to show uh, more readable and informative output to the users. That way they can have a better understanding of uh, what's going on, making the information a little bit more digestible. Uh, we also have a few bug fixes. Uh, community contributor Jay Rodriguez 556 uh, replaced deprecated URI and code function uh, usage in the PHP FPM RCE. Uh, I myself fixed an uh, issue when the Enum DNS module that affected uh, zone transfers and the uh, specific name servers that were specified by the user in the data store. Uh, Rapid7's Christopher Greenlease fixed an issue in uh, store loot in which certain data types were not being properly stored. And community contributor uh, Matus Bursa added uh, the missing a NASM dependency to ensure that the NASM shell works uh, when running inside of Docker. Uh, community contributor uh, Bartik improved uh, his own execute.net assembly module, which uh, he was the original author of, and he added in uh, support for additional function signatures into that module. So now uh, you can run uh, .NET code and inject it, um, whether or not it takes uh, any arguments in the main method or if it takes uh, like an array of string arguments. So fix that handling there. Uh, community contributor Hoodie fixed a crash in uh, the auxiliary analyze apply pot module, uh, which deals with uh, the pot files generated by uh, John the Ripper and other uh, cracking routines within Metasploit. Um, our own Alan David Foster added a uh, proper synchronization to the job status tracker that's used by Metasploit's RPC service. And uh, Christopher Greenlease uh, fixed a crash in Metasploit's uh, generate command caused uh, when a tab complete input had uh, no results. So another nice usability improvement there. Uh, so huge thank you to everyone that contributed bug fixes, enhancements, and brand new modules. Um, thank you to absolutely everyone. Um, as always, uh, the Metasploit Weekly Wrap-Up is another fantastic source to keep up with uh, the latest and greatest changes into Metasploit. So huge thank you to the community. All right, and uh, this takes us right into our uh, demo section. Uh, so Grant, are you ready to show us the uh, MSF uh, DB uh, user improvements? This is um, a quick update to the Metasploit database. Um, components. So if you just want to start the video here, basically what we've done is we've gone ahead and just um, updated the output a little bit. So before, if you ran the MSF DB delete command and then you ran the MSF DB start command, it would kind of throw out a bunch of errors, but it wasn't clear what the actual root error was, um, which was specifically that the database file doesn't exist. Um, now, if you run it, you'll see that we've got a couple of uh, separators that help make the output a bit easier to read. And we've also added additional highlighting. So you can see within the first line, it's much, sorry, much clearer to see that it's now a problem with the database not being found. And we also have a couple of helpful hints like saying, hey, maybe you need to go ahead and initialize the database. Um, and you can also see we've separated it into the uh, database related um, errors and web service related errors. So they're no longer grouped together into one large output. Um, they're properly separated out now. Uh, Grant, looks like you're back up with another uh, demo. Yep. Okay. So this, this one was an interesting uh, case of a crash, which I thought was worth discussing. So um, just for context, this has come up quite a few times in the past and we haven't really found out what the root cause was, but eventually we did um, find it out. And so if you just want to play the video so long. So basically the error that occurs here is that if you ran MSF console in the past um, and then you try to do tab completion, occasionally it would actually crash the entire uh, MSF console. Um, this is not a desirable situation to say the least because uh, you end up losing all of your sessions um, and whatever else is running at the time. So it wasn't a great user experience. Um, 
but we did manage to figure it out. So in this case, I'm just going to show you what happened in the past. Um, this is the stack trace that occurs. So you can see if I try and uh, run a generate command or just really any command that returns like no results um, during the tab completion, then it will end up crashing. So I'm just undoing the um, the changes to the file. So we have the patch apply that was implemented. Um, and now I'm going to try run this again and run the same set of commands. And you'll see that now instead of crashing, we just get no results. So this makes for a much better user experience overall. So we'll just go ahead and verify this here. So you can see now I'm hitting tab and it's not crashing. All right, uh, Shelby, are you ready to uh, demo the WordPress file manager RCE? Yep. Yeah. Perfect, take it away. Okay. Uh, yeah, you can go ahead. Okay. Yeah, so uh, so basically uh, this exploit gets off unauthenticated uh, rotcat execution against WP file manager for, uh, it's a plugin for WordPress. And so basically what happens is for vulnerable installations of this plugin, uh, there is an example file left over that basically opens up a set of commands uh, that anyone can use against the plugin, basically. And um, among those set of commands, there is an upload command uh, that allows you to upload a file and eventually get code execution. And that's what you're seeing here. Sorry for the small text. Oh, I'll introduce I'll introduce Spencer McIntyre since he, <laughs> this is awesome. Been, thank you. <laughs> yeah, this is Spencer McIntyre is going to show us the the new Salt Stack module. I think from Wilvu. Is that right? That's right. The newest Salt Stack module. There you go. So uh, th this demo is going to be a little bit short. It doesn't quite do the vulnerability uh, justice. Uh, this module actually leverages uh, two vulnerabilities. There is an authentication bypass, and then a uh, remote command injection vulnerability, and the module will chain the two together to bypass authentication to access the vulnerable API to ultimately yield uh, code execution. So you would like to go ahead and play it here. It's a uh, bit of a quick one, but just goes to kind of show how these vulnerabilities are very powerful. Uh, so we have a check method that is fully implemented to go ahead and check to see if you can actually authent or excuse me, bypass the authentication so it knows that it's vulnerable to uh, that first CVE, and then we can go ahead and leverage that to execute our payload. And in this case, uh, we have a number of targets that are available. Um, we opted to utilize the uh, dropper on Linux so we can go ahead and open a interpreter. We also have the ability to execute uh, command shells. And then there are, I think, uh, yeah, I think I might actually be misspeaking. I think I'm mixing this up with another, uh, another module. I think this one is just uh, command shells and uh, a Linux dropper. Nice. And again, uh, this module is implemented by uh, William Vu, so thanks to him for this. All right, uh, Christoph, are you ready to uh, show us the uh, WordPress Loginizer uh, SQL I scanner? Yes, yeah, sure. Perfect. Take it away, Christoph. Thanks. Uh, so Loginizer is a WordPress plugin uh, designed to improve security of the login capability by adding protections. Um, against brute force and such, uh, for example, blocking IP to uh, second uh, factor uh, authentication, user account lookout, and etc. So uh, versions before 1.6.4 are vulnerable to an authenticated time-based SQL injection. And uh, you have to keep in mind that WordPress has to be branches 5.4 and 5.5 to be successful for this, for this exploit because before that there were some, uh, uh, some filters applied to username when you, uh, and well, th th those filters were uh, preventing the SQL injection to work. 
Uh, also, if you're trying to run this against a non-vulnerable version of this uh, application, this plugin, you will likely be blocked by Loganizer itself because it is what it's actually doing. Uh, please, can you uh, go ahead and, and start the video? Thanks. All right, so this uh, exploit consists in and sending an HTTP POST request to the standard WP login.php, uh, which is the standard WordPress uh, login page. Uh, so this POST request would be sent with a specially crafted log parameter, which is the parameter that contains the username, uh, which is uh, 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 the entry point for this attack. So it is a time-based SQL injection. Uh, that means it can take some time to complete. So here we are setting options, including the count options, which is the number of items we want to retrieve from the database. So here I edited the video because it took me roughly 10 minutes to uh, get this information from the database. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, here we go. So we have the three credentials and also the database, the, the Metasploit database is populated with the right information here. All right, Alan, are you ready for uh, the Zookeeper information disclosure demo? Uh, yep. Perfect. Uh, awesome. So this is a community contributed module by Karn, and it is a Zookeeper information disclosure. Um, you can first use the module, and then the next slide you'll see the settings. Uh, not much settings to play around with, just the R host and the R port. And then once that's set, you can go ahead and run it. And the information that you can extract is environmental details. Um, as you can see there, you've got like Java class path and such. And then the next slide, you'll see that you can also extract uh, connection details um, and brief details about the Zookeeper service that's currently running. Uh, so this is sort of happy path. This information is stored as loot. And then on the final slide, uh, this is a demo of the scenario where you're targeting a Zookeeper host which does not have this information disclosure present. Turns out that to extract this information, it's making use of some commands such as are you okay, stat, and en uh, vi. Um, and to actually access that information, the server that you're targeting needs to have that enabled. Uh, and that is reliant on the 4LW commands whitelist configuration value. Um, so it's sort of Two, two cases there, both happy path and what will happen if the server does not have that information disclosure um, present. Awesome, thank you, Alan. All right, and that uh, concludes it for the uh, framework uh, community side. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you, Spencer. And thank you for all the demos, everybody. Those are great, I uh, appreciate that. We'll roll into our, our final section of updates for uh, Attacker KB, the Attacker Knowledge Base, where you can learn about and discuss which vulns matter and why. Just visit attackerkb.com. Um, we've had, you know, we went GA last month. Uh, real exciting. The team's been, you know, plowing forward with, with new stuff as well. And we've got a couple of demos today to show off some of that. Uh, we'll start out with a demo from Aaron uh, on enhanced revision history. All right, so uh, this is going to be a quick demo of uh, enhanced revision history, which is part of our efforts to make AKB more information dense and make uh, make every page a little bit uh, more clear as to what you're looking at. So uh, I'm going to scroll down to the first revision um, on this topic, which is going to have the most changes because it started from new. And you'll see we have a lot more uh, green on the page now. So we are now displaying... Um, diffs for the disclosure date, the CVSS base score, um, all of these three categories here at the top. And uh, I'll go to another topic just to show you a couple more things that are new. Uh, let's see, I believe this is the correct revision. Yeah, so on the Vuln Details tab, we're also diffing the lists of vendor and product information. 
So um, we still have more to do. Uh, there's some other information on this page that is not yet getting dipped, such as references, such as attacker value score, but this was the huge step forward into just getting more of our, uh, more of our information um, displayable in a good format to the user. And this sets us up well to add more of this stuff in the future. So uh, small but powerful change in my opinion, and hopefully this will be useful to people viewing revisions. Any questions before I stop sharing? Are you showing dips of revisions from uh, user reviews? You mean the uh, the assessments? Yeah. Uh, no. So when you go back in time, the assessments are not showing the difference between uh, if they were edited or not. Uh, that that's a good idea, though. Something we could potentially add. They, you so you can, can go back see it by clicking the arrow. Correct. Yeah. So you can click the arrow and view a particular. There was no change there. Uh, view a particular dip within an assessment, but you're seeing the page as it was at that moment in time, and not necessarily seeing the assessment diff view within the topic diff view. If that makes well, thank sense. Thank you. Does the new changes, um, do they work for their R7 analysis too? Um, I don't believe so, um, but they could in the future. Okay. <laughs> Neat. Cool. Awesome, yeah, thank I you. Love that change. Yeah. And that is on production right now, it looks like, yeah? Yes, yes it is. Cool. Super, thank you, Aaron. And our last demo today uh, will come from Jorge Huerta. Uh, Jorge, you on the line? Yes, sir. Super. You want me just to go ahead and start the video? Or yeah, do you just start playing. playing. Okay, here we go. All right, you go. On. Hello, everyone. So as uh, Pierce introduced me, my name is Jorge Huerta. And today I'll be demoing you the unsubscribe request feature that we've added to Attacker KB. Uh, so the goal of this feature was to allow users to quickly and easily unsubscribe from email notifications. Um, I don't know about y'all, but if a website tries to make it hard for me to unsubscribe from their emails, I will go out of my way to avoid using that website altogether. And we didn't want that for our users. So there are four main ways that users will be able to unsubscribe uh, from their email notifications from Attacker KB. Uh, this is when the user is logged in and they access attackerkb.com forward slash unsubscribe. As you can see, the user's email field is pre-filled in and it gives them an option to unsubscribe from that, uh, from all Attacker KB emails. And there's also a little nudge to like push them to manage their individual notifications. That way they don't just completely get um, put out of all email notifications. And they could just click on subscribe and they'll get a verification uh, on that page that just confirms that they successfully unsubscribed. There, I did my little dance around the unsubscribe button. Uh, <laughs> um, but in the next one, uh, once I finally click on it, uh, we could see uh, the view that the user will see if they're on a different device that they might not be logged into GitHub on. Um, so they might not be logged in. The email address field will have a placeholder email. They'll fill in their email. Um, they can choose to unsubscribe, but this time the little nudge at the bottom tells them to log in first if they want to modify uh, their email notification settings. So uh, the thing is though, that we don't really anticipate seeing users access their uh, attackerkb.com forward slash unsubscribe. Instead, more than likely, we will see them uh, try to unsubscribe through their emails. So we've added a link to the email footer. Um, and this link has parameters at the, uh, in the link um, that show the email type and the user's email, which is base64 encoded that way we don't just show their email in plain text. So in this tab, we see the user is logged out, but they clicked on the link and we see that the email address is uh, decoded uh, for the user's email. 
And as you can see, jhalbred under mifflin.com uh, just appears inside the email field and they're given an option to unsubscribe from a specific type of email notification uh, to unsubscribe from all attacker KB emails. Um, and we once again see that little nudge to log in and modify their, uh, their email notifications on their profile page. So what happens if the user's already logged in, but they open the link uh, from a different email? So we will see that once I decide to click on the last tab. Um, the email that will be used will be the one of the user that is currently logged in. That will take precedence over the email in the link parameter. Um, but they're still given the option to uh, unsubscribe from the specific email notification uh, and also to the same thing as before, unsubscribe from all attacker KB emails and the little nudge to log in and uh, get the granular uh, change for their email notifications. Excellent.